I'm Kevin Cameron. I've got a an open H1 crankcase here with the gearbox and crankshaft and a few gears to talk about some of the causes of poor shifting. Not that you'd want to do anything about it. Most of the problems with poor shifting are traceable to causes that are outside the engine. It's quite common for people in attempting to adjust the height of the shift pedal to suit the limits of their ankles to get the thing, the linkage, in such a state that it cramps against itself when you make the shift and doesn't push the shift claw far enough to engage the gear fully. So it's a good idea, if you have a shifting problem, to look for the problem in the external linkage first, especially if you've recently made a change. Inside the engine, as I've described, engagement of one gear to another, this is a free spinning gear, and this one you see has splines inside of it. The engagement takes place when one set of dogs is pushed into engagement with another. The two gears now rotate as one. This gear has six dogs, this gear has three dogs. The space into which the engaging dogs can fit determines how much time there is for the shift to complete. So it is better for rapid shifting to have fewer rather than more dogs because this wide space here allows more chance that the gears will promptly engage than when you have twice as many dogs as here and the space between them is so small. For this reason, Eager racers of an earlier era used to use an abrasive cutoff disc to saw out every other dog. On the other hand, touring riders and other people who are going to spend time on and off the throttle in traffic are annoyed by the large clunk of backlash between dogs that have a lot of space between them. One way in which this is dealt with in some designs is to have six dogs, but to have every other dog cut down to one half of its height. So the initial shift is made in a condition in which three dogs are engaging with three dogs. And once the engagement is made, the backlash is quite small because of the half height dogs, which are now, once the shift is fully engaged, they bear and cut the backlash in half. At one point I was riding to and from work on a little Kawasaki 90 and every once in a while it would half shift and then I would have to make the shift over again. And when you're accelerating on a little bike with a weak little engine, missing a shift is a disturbance to your momentum. So I thought about that, and I decided that what must be happening is that somehow the dogs were hitting head to head, which is quite common, but instead of slipping off and into engagement, that maybe there were little surface defects, possibly manufacturing problem. On the surfaces, the faces of the engagement dogs, such that when it chanced to hit head to head like this, that instead of quickly slipping off and into engagement, that the defects on the surface spun around together and wouldn't allow the shift to complete. That evening, I took the engine out of the frame, took the cylinder off, split the cases. Sure enough, there were the little defects on the faces of the dogs. So, I took a piece of plate glass, I laid a a sheet of 220 abrasive paper on it. I surfaced it until those faces of the dogs were shining. Then I reassembled the engine. As Mr. Yoshida used to say in the early 1970s, 
no more trouble again. I was so pleased because I had thought the thing through and when I looked for the problem, there it was, a problem that had up to that moment existed only in theory. Now when you look at a completed gearbox, you can see that this one is in neutral, that the dogs are clear from one another. They're not close to engaging. I can get several thumbnails worth in, in between, so the dogs are far enough apart. But it's possible to arrange it so that if some of the shimming is wrong, that the gears don't, the dogs don't go to full engagement. That is a problem for experienced persons to deal with. And it seldom happens on uh, production gearboxes these days. I have spoken before about the shift from first to second, which is a difficult one because of the speed difference being larger than from second to third and so forth. Quite often the engaging dogs on second get rounded off by spirited shifting. And all it takes is new parts. If you want to shift that way, bang them through clutchless shifting, um, there may be a cost, but if we're real enthusiasts, we don't mind replacing gears, do we? Another set of problems comes about from pushing the shift drum either too far, in which case the gearbox, when you make a shift, jumps into a neutral above the, the ratio you were selecting, or uh, an undershift in which it kicks back out of the ratio you were shifting into. This sector right here is one example of a method that is used to limit the throw of the shifter. There's an eccentric pin which exists in the assembled engine that determines how far the shift arm can move. And sometimes um, in the deep pass I found that that adjustment was not correct. And when I corrected it I could see that the shift claw pushed the shift drum almost into the next position, usually with a millimeter clearance here. Because if it, if it was still pushing it when it got into position, it might kick it past that position and halfway to the next gear. So the rule that I found, which worked for me, was that the shift claw should stop pushing about a millimeter before the shift drum drops into its next locked detented position. One millimeter clearance either way. At one point in my early days I had a bike with a Berman gearbox which instead of having dogs like this had fine splines and that was valued by some riders because it had almost no backlash but it was the scourge of people who wanted to shift quickly because there was so little space between one spline and the next, which offered very little time for a rapid engagement. So in general, those uh, Berman gearboxes with spline dogs were not for the sporting rider. All of this stuff makes sense to you after you've played with it a lot. And what I suggest to those of you who are interested in doing this kind of work, get yourself a junk motorcycle and play with it. It's the only way you're going to get familiar with what the parts actually look like.